everyone, it's Tasha D here, two-time Olympian and Olympic bronze medalist, and welcome to another episode of Global Sports Channel's Sports Personality Spotlight. My guest today, world record holder. Do I need to say more? Like, seriously, world record holder. I'm not even going to say anymore. I'm just going to bring him right in. There's no need to say any more than that. I'll let him tell you the rest. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome the one and only Kevin Young. Kevin, welcome. Good afternoon. How do you do? Well, yes, afternoon for me, but not afternoon for you because you're actually in Europe, right? Yes, I am. I'm in Switzerland. Switzerland. Yes. I know your journey started in what? How did you end up in Switzerland? COVID. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there you go. There you go. Yeah, my journey started in, of all places, it started in, in Swansea. I flew into the UK back in um, 2019, September 2019, and I was taking courses there um, in a master's, pursuing a master's degree in sports ethics and integrity of all things. And um, it started off at Swansea University down there in Wales, and then we traveled to to Belgium. And the fact that it's an Erasmus program funded by the EU, you know, the UK was making their exit out of the whole situation, so I literally right. had to uproot from the UK, go to Belgium and start classes by second semester there. And um, and then obviously I came here in uh, after our break. And then I've been here since then. Since then I got friends that live here in Switzerland. So I've been nice. and holding me down for the most part. I bet. And there's a, there's a lot going on right now. So we, we, we all need as many friends as we can get right now. What, I mean, I, I, I we're going to get to the beginning, but what made you decide to do a master's in those subjects that you chose? Like, where where did that come from? What what are you? you where want, are you, you planning you to the do? K, you, you want the, the the PC answer, or you want the K Young? I want Wasuka the Hero? I want the K Young keeping it real, the real deal, saying um, what he's <laughs> being him. Okay, this 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 would happen. You know, over the past, um, I've been you know two time Olympian like yourself. Um, first games in 1988 and. I had been, you know, obviously U.S. team, Team USA alumni for a number of years, part of their speakers bureau, but never got a call from 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 the from the from the organization for decades. Um, and I've always had received different sorts of emails from the USOC over the over the years. And some of them I looked at them, some of them I just kind of trashed. Uh, but this one particular um, email I got, and all, in all actuality, it was I think forwarded to me by Sharifa Sharifa Barksdale, my girl. My sister, and uh, so she forwarded me the email because she works uh, USATF alumni, and so it was an Erasmus program in which uh, they were, you know, providing opportunities for Olympians at this present time, um, retired Olympians, I guess you would say, obviously. And I end up filling out the um, the form, and so I be honest with you, I did it out of spite. I was like, well, you know what, I'm going to fill this out. I know I'm not going to get a call back or they're not going to they're not going to reach out to me. They haven't done it in 10, 15, 20 years. And um, so I filled out the paperwork, sent it in and uh, I got a call back. (laughs) And what what ended up happening was um, they had literally they had given out the scholarships. But the uh, one of the bit one of the uh, benefactors of the the organization that works with the um, with the program, one of our chairpersons, he, they put up their own funds to provide a scholarship for some lucky individual because they had already given out the uh, the scholarships that the uh, the uh, Olympic Solidarity Program were providing. So I actually got lucky enough. I was on the top of that second list, and it was one of those situations in which it was like, okay, you you know, you have an opportunity to take the scholarship or receive the scholarship. If you if you didn't, you know don't want it, we'll obviously give it to the next person in line. And um, I had like maybe 48 hours to think about it. And I was literally in transition um, back in Georgia. So I was like, okay, so what do I do? What do I do? Um, and I said, you know, this is something I've always wanted to, you know, wanted to do. I've always discussed this and talked about it, about pursuing a graduate degree, but never gave myself the time to do it. And I was working um, in the workforce in corporate America uh, for a f- number of years. And this granted me an opportunity, not just to uh, pursue the graduate degree, but also to travel to, um, uh, I would say, kind of like a fresh start. And so literally, I um, I got the phone call. 
uh, followed it up and it was one of those situations where, okay, you have to be in the UK in September. <laughs> like I said, the, uh, the process started in April with you know, sending in the application. Um, then I getting vetted and getting interviewed by uh, the, some of the professors. But the, the irony of it all, this, this is really crazy. When I actually, when I, when I sent in the paperwork, you know, usually the, 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 the scholarship offers in which the uh, USA, um, Team USA they provide are usually um, online scholarships. You know, a lot of the grad degrees are either at uh, DeVry University, Strayer University, maybe yeah. University of Phoenix. So they're all these online courses. And so literally in the back of my mind, I was telling myself, this must be, you know, this is going to be an online course. Um, but, and then I get, it kind of resonated that, no, Kevin, you literally, literally have to relocate out of the U.S. and fly over to Europe uh, to pursue the scholarship uh, for this education. And I was like, okay. And so I end up, you know, throwing everything in storage and, um, I went to go uh, sleep on my cousin's couch. <laughs> uh, yeah, waited for um, waited for a few, you know, you know, a couple weeks, running around with John, and uh, so that was really cool. So I got a chance to talk with John for uh, about going back to school. John Carlos, that is. I'm sorry, yeah. and um, going back to school and pursuing a degree. And uh, he was like, "Yo, Kev, you got to do it. Go, you know, go to Europe and enjoy yourself." And like I said, the interesting thing about it, in the exception, I thought it was an online degree. So, of course, I'm there in Swansea. I'm, I'm, I'm getting reacclimated. I'm going to classes in, 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 in Swansea. They have two campuses. So I was literally, you know, one campus was really close to student housing, which I was living in. So I can actually walk through the park, through the woods, go to campus. And then the other campus that they had classes uh, half the semester was the Bay Campus. So we had to get on the bus go through Swans through the city, go all the way around to the bay, um, to that campus. And that was like maybe a 45 minute ride on the bus uh, in the morning. So that was the uh, the difference between that. Um, but when the that first semester ended, we flew over, had to go actually to the second semester, which was in Belgium. So I had, had to relocate from there to Belgium. But the, the cool thing is, um, like I said, um, once I got to Belgium, did the whole second semester, and right around March, um, you know, the, the COVID kind of creeped over that way, and everything went from going to classes in the morning to shut down. Everything went online, yeah. and yeah. I'm like, wow! It ended up becoming an online course anyway. Right. And, you know, and even right now, I'm, I'm supposed to be in Germany, um, taking, take, you know, because like I said, it, it shifts from different campuses, about five different campuses, and. Um, I was supposed to be in, 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 in Mainz at the uh, Johannesburg University there for the, the third semester. Uh, but of course, COVID hit Germany real hard. And then I was already here in Switzerland. Everything was online. And so I was like, you know what? I'll just post up here um, and just, you know, get on the computer like everybody else and, and, and finish up with the courses. So, uh, you know, it's, it's been really cool. I've been learning a lot about football. Right. <laughs> the, the the British, the European version. Yeah, yeah, not not American football. football. The one you play with your feet. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, I mean, I guess in a way that's kind of cool. You you're used to because of your career as a track and field athlete, used to traveling the world in jet setting. But as I mentioned, the early days weren't like that. You you grew up in Watts. You've lived in Compton. Like what? What was it like for someone who comes from that area to aspire to, you know, end up traveling the world and things like that? Kids in that area. And let's be fair, like what is probably a little bit different than it was when you grew up. You know, it's got. No oh, yes, yeah, it's a big difference. <laughs> you know, but what's in the 80s, you know, during the time you grew up? What was that like? What what was it like for a young black boy growing up? In Watts in the eighties. In, in the neighborhood, it's interesting because um, I was born in Watts as a child, um, living near the Nickerson Gardens on 113th Street um, in Compton Avenue. And then we moved after the riot. Um, I was born in '66, so after the riots, my mom, um, we all moved to Compton to Park Village. Um, so I grew up first few years of my life in Park Village apartment complex, and uh, that was really interesting because I re <laughs> I remember. Um, my oldest, my sister's babysitting me a lot, taking me around. Um, literally, literally I, I, I wouldn't lie to you. They literally, I remember my sister took me to, to school with her. 
She didn't want to miss school. My mom told her to stay stay home and watch me because we had to have daycare every time. And my sister literally <laughs> took me to school with her. Wow. And uh, and I was like show and tell. Uh, <laughs> her little brother. But uh, I, I definitely remember growing up, uh, my early early days were in Compton. I was, you know, grew up in Compton. And then we moved over to, um, to on Cookacre Avenue, right near the uh, near Atlantic, and um, I think it was at Bradfield, over that way, uh, Rosecrans. And grow, you know, growing up over there, and um, that's when I had a really cool childhood. That's when you were when you were a kid, you could able to, you know, you're able to walk to school by yourself, right. you know. But I had like a whole clutch of uh, older sisters with me. I had one, two, three sisters, four sisters with me at the time, actually. Um, but it was it was really interesting because I literally remember growing up in Compton where that whole tide of of gangs were, were going down toward the city and as a, as a you know three four five year old I'm say mm, that was in first grade so I was about five or six um watching all these teenagers just on the block um and just this big shift of of of, of energy you know and mm. in the neighborhood um but then when I moved uh, from one side of Compton to to, to Linwood at one point in time, because I used to, I went to middle school. My first middle school I went to actually was Hostler Junior High School in Linwood. I think I did the seventh grade there. Right. And when I was in Hostler for a minute, um, they, they found out I lived out of the district. Uh, yeah, and so I ended up getting kicked out of there. And it's funny because we, I was literally living off of, in Inglewood at the time. We moved out of Compton, my mom moved out of Compton to Inglewood. And then we got a house in Linwood, written a house in Linwood for a while when I was in the seventh grade. But then when I moved from Linwood to Compton, that's when um, a lot of the, uh, the whole, the gang proliferation was, 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 was kicking in. Right. And um, I, re I just remember uh, going up when I was at Roosevelt, Roosevelt Junior High School on Alondra. I was there uh, for the rest of the seventh grade and then the eighth and half of the eighth grade. So I spent, I spent my time in, um, on Willow Avenue off Compton Boulevard, uh, just, you know, going through the neighborhood and just kind of literally watching the proliferation between living in Linwood and living in Compton, watching the proliferation of, 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 of gang activity. Because a lot of the young cats that were my age, they were really getting caught up in it. And um, I had a, my mom was really, you know, she was, she kept me close to the vest, kept me in church. And I was like one of those church boys that, you know, Sunday, early Sunday morning, you're in church. Once you got, you know, once I got back back home from church, growing up, I was hanging out with my partners, and um, I used to be a little kleptomaniac. And when I lived in Compton, though, <laughs> I used to, I used to do little B and E's. I was breaking and I was breaking houses and stuff like that. Um, all kind of interesting stuff uh, that I probably need to write in the book. Yeah. <laughs> however, however, I think I think what my saving grace was I was always around positive men. Um, you know, because I, I grew up my early my early early years, my dad was in a, was was in the house. I wouldn't say he wasn't around, but he mm. wasn't in the house. And I remember uh, I had really good friends when I used to live in the, this uh, this huge apartment complex called the Walls, thirty one thirty Euclid Avenue, apartment one hundred seven. I never forget. And um, it was like anything and everything that can go bad and go wrong in that in that in that in that unit. It was it was it was going on there, but it was like. I was watching a television, you know, watching watching a TV episode, you know, looking out of the window, and just watching all sorts of things going on. But it, it, I think my love for sports literally kind of kept me uh, motivated, kind of kept me encouraged, and uh, kept me as a big dreamer. Because um, I, 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 you know, you grew, I grew up in a, in a state and age where you know you, you, you played street ball, you different uh, neighborhoods played one another at the local local school local playground. Um, it was really more cordial to rec uh, recreation. It was like I said, it was before any other gang activity, and it was it was way before where you where you had to be really protective of what neighborhoods you were able to walk into and go into before you got checked. Um, and so it was it was one of those cool things where you just knew everybody because either your older brothers or sisters, you know, went to school with folks, other brothers and sisters, and it just kind of went from there. Uh, but like I said, when I started shifting around in Compton and then the gang proliferation picked up, it really wasn't until, I mean, I'm telling you, when, when the crack cocaine came in the, into the neighborhood. And I remember moving from, from, from Compton, moving to Watts, and I had to finish up the rest of the eighth grade and ninth grade. I was at Markham Middle School. And, you know, there it was just a, a, another whole situation.
um, it was it was it was you know it was like I guess you would say just a different click. You had cats that you know wanted wanted to bang. You had cats that was into sports. You had you know individuals that you know wanted to go to school uh, or wanted to be involved in school. So the, the interesting thing about it is everybody met up on campus <laughs> and they right. kind of drifted from there. Uh, like I said, I had friends that were you know seriously you know. In, in, in gangs, I mean, it was the norm, but it, 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 it was, like I said, it was the norm, but it was like, if that's something that you really wanted to do and pursue, you had that opportunity. In my case, that was something I didn't want to get involved in because right. I literally yeah. saw, like I said, I saw the proliferation of it as growing up as a kid. And my get down was always, was always sports, you know? Right. I always right. wanted to be a basketball right. player. That didn't work out for me. <laughs> and then when I got involved in, in, um, in track and field, um, that was one of that was one of the greater pursuits in which I did have, and um, I became very productive at it. Uh, and like I said, I started being become bigger, more of a bigger of a dreamer when it came to the athletics because um, it really it, re it really gave me an opportunity. Because a lot of folks don't know I'm, I'm a Virgo, I'm an introvert, um, and you know growing up as an introvert, <laughs> and, and so a lot of times I really I can get into my own head, and so. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, my escape from a lot of that stuff was just, you know, sports was always an escape for me. Uh, I would sit around, um, you know, read books, um, you know, just kind of really get into myself, my little K Young mode, um, and don't really be bothered by a lot of things. And so I was never really one to let, you know, large groups of people kind of move me around and pursue me. I mean, I think that, that comes from growing up in a household with older sisters. You know, right. I've been bullied. I've been punched around. I've been kicked out the house at midnight, you know, because my, right. my sister's mad at me and my mom's at work and they, you know, I get bum rushed and throw out on the porch. And like, I had to sit there, with, you know, and just deal with it. Uh, <laughs> it's funny now when I think about it. But like I said, I, I, it was always a challenge. And so I realized as, a, as, as that introvert, something you just got to you know, keep your mouth shut sometimes and just keep and just kind of move around at your own time. Um, right. And I always had a real pretty good intuition as well. I think what my mom told me when um, I think it was the, her when her father died, she, she I think he told her that he was going to keep an eye on me. She had a dream that he was going to keep an eye on me. And I'm telling you, I it, it must be true because I think over the period of my of my life, there's been many situations in which I've actually had very many uh, many close calls, and some just like Kev, you know, go home, you know, right, dip. right. You know, be right. the, you got to be the coward sometimes. You know, if, if 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 that's what you're looking at, you know, and a lot of those situations where I follow my instincts, say say literally saved my life. You know, it kept me at home where I knew I was going to be in certain areas and certain places in the neighborhood when something jumped off, and and then the next day you go to school and you hear about it and you go, wow, I was literally supposed to be there with that person. Um, right. Um, but I, like I said, my, my, I had a real my I had a, a really cool balance though. I had a, a balance of being you know get getting caught up in a lot of mess when I lived in Compton, you know, being in church, um, listening to the word, um, and, 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 and literally sitting around um, good people. Um, like I said, I grew up in, you know, I grew up in an era where, you know, where you can go to the barbershop and listen to the, to the men and they talk about sports and talk about, uh, you know, you know, even the, their, 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 their athletic pursuits that they may have had when they were, when they were young. I remember growing up, going to the barbershop uh, with my mom. We used to go to Ted's Barbershop on uh, Rosecrans near Willowbrook, right near, uh, what, what school was that? Um, it was a Harriet Tubman. It was a Harriet Tubman High School uh, for the young ladies. And I used to go to the barbershop there. My, and once I got in the barbershop, I would go in there and I'd pick up the, the Jet and Ebony magazines and flip through them and i listen to the sports on the radio. Uh, and that was before barbershops had flat screen TVs and, and uh, in EA Sports, you know, you literally had to sit there and read a magazine. So, I, but it was it was it was wonderful because, you, you know, you got a chance to look at the uh, the Jet Magazine, the Centerfold, read all the Ebony's, look at the Who's Who in Black America, and that was like one of my earliest points of education. Literally hanging out in the barbershop, listening to the conversations of the gentlemen there. Um, but most importantly, I think literally just reading Ebony Magazine. And like I said, one of my one of my biggest heroes was was Lebron. Um, Lerone Bennett Jr. Uh, and he was a publisher for uh, Johnson Johnson Publishing, uh, for, uh, Ebony Magazine, uh, and all those all those great. And he was a historian as well. And I think one of the highlights of my life was growing up as a kid reading those those manuscripts, 
and then finally meeting the gentleman that I've seen his name in the caption so many times. And um, he knew who I was when I met him. And it was just really fun for me to actually share a moment in time with him. And it was it was literally on the, on the plane when I was flying back from Barcelona after I set the world record. He actually happened to be on the plane when I was flying back to, to L.A. And when I saw him, I was like, oh, that's, that's LeBron Benny Jr. And, uh, I, you know, eased up on him. And uh, I said, <laughs> you know how you walk up, up, up on somebody and tell them who they are? You know who you know you so and so and so, right? <laughs> and <laughs> I did that to him. And um, I just told him, I said, yo, it wasn't for you, man. I wouldn't know anything about, uh, you know, my, my heroes. I remember just mm -hmm. flipping through the Black History books that he had, he had helped publish. Um, you know, seeing pictures of, you know, Tommy Smith, John Carlos, and Michael Jackson, and James Brown, and Al Green, all the politicians, uh, Jesse Jackson, just, you know, like I said, just reading through all the information, all the documentation that he, historical information that he, that he researched and wrote about. Um, and those things, those are books that my mom constantly kept in the house um, for us to kind of, you know, read about. And I think, I thank her for that um, to this day. Um, but the cool piece is, is just, you know, you have these, when you're young and you're flipping through these books and you see, you know, Cassius Clay and Muhammad Ali, right? Uh, Jim Brown. And you see, uh, like I said, like Tommy and John and, 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 and the Mighty Burner. Uh, you know, you see Lee Evans, uh, Ron Freeman. I mean, I remember, I literally remember flipping through the pictures of the, of the, of the, of the men and women on that 68 team, just being in awe um, behind that. Um, because I really struck a chord, um, you know, growing up, coming, uh, you know, growing up in Watson Compton, and those were always dynamic figures. Uh, I mean, in, in a lot of a lot of part of the bar barbershop talk, um, and 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 it meant so much to me knowing their history. And it's funny as I got older, I didn't realize the different connections in which I was going to have with those individuals in my life, um, and it's and it's incredible because um, I realized as you know as I as I gotten as old as I am now. You never know who you're going to come across, who, you, who, who whose paths you're going to come across, uh, who you're going to meet up the, uh, along the way, um, and, and 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 try to make the best situations out of situations that seem pretty bleak. Um, but that was one thing that I've always, you know, I've always looked on the bright side because you know I, I'm, you know, I remember be honest with you, I remember as a, as a child when I was um, we were living in Compton. And then we took that 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 cross country trip from 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 Compton to Mississippi to my people's down there in Brookhaven, and you know you you grow up young and you thinking you know you are poor disadvantaged black kid growing up in the in the in the hood, and um, I got a wake up call when when I went down to to Mississippi that one that point and I went my my grandmother she had a fish route she used to do, she had an old little Toyota truck she used to get in. And she used to drive the back country of, of Mississippi, and she would have this, these uh, igloo, igloo um, uh, coolers, right? And she would pack them with fish, fresh fish. She'd go get the fresh fish and pack them. And she literally would drive through, through the sticks in Brookhaven to all these families, and she would, she would sell them, you know, sell them fresh fish and candy bars and all that cool type of stuff. And um, I remember as a kid in the, her, in, the, in the car with her, I was like, Grandma, I want to go and get in the truck with you. And, and go on your with your, with your fish rod you take. And she said, okay, come on. And I remember we were on dirt roads, in the woods on dirt roads. And literally, I mean, pulling up. And, and, uh, and it's crazy now, because uh, I'm thinking about Cicely Tyson. I remember when uh, the movie Sounder came out. And if you ever saw the movie Sounder, you saw those homes that those people lived in, in that time period. And I'm talking the 70s, um, mid-70s. And I'm in Mississippi with my grandmother, you know, in the in the, in the country off a dirt road, and literally we were pulling up this, going down this one dirt road, and I never forget it was a house that literally looked like those homes in Sounder. It was wood plank, galvanized steel on the roof, and literally had burlap in the windows. And that just, as a you know, as a young, and it just floored me. I didn't think people lived like literally lived like that. I um, mean, like I said, I'm growing up and growing up in Compton and Watts, and and uh, not even really plugging in. I'm thinking that's some you know on television, something from you know from the 20s, you know, the 30s, or, or even beyond that. Right. And we're decades later, and folks were living really living in, in those um, in those sort of conditions. And uh, 
I was shocked because, like I said, I'd never seen anything like that firsthand. But I was humbled as well because my grandmother got out the car, I mean, out the truck, pulled out the, you know, pulled out the, uh, the, uh, did the, dropped the flatbed down, pulled out the fish, sat there, pulled out a scale, and she was weighing fish. She had me wrapping up fish in newspaper, and, and um, the interesting thing about it is, I, she, everybody who she, how she went to, she, get, I guess they was buying it on credit because she wrote a look, got a little notebook, she flipped it out, wrote how much they may have older, and um, she. Gave him, the, gave him the little the, 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 the fish and all that, and um, and we moved on. i never forget, I remember I had like maybe 3 or $4 in my pocket that she had given me, and it was all these little kids running around, and I was like, wow, you know what? I ended up buying candy bars. I bought like four or five candy bars with the money that I had and passed it out to the youngest. And I was, and I was like, wow. That's, you know, that, was a, that was like the most humblingest, the humblingest experience of my life. Right. And uh, from that moment on, when I got back, when I got back to to, to, to Cali, you, you wouldn't. It was nothing you can tell me about being a poor black child because I realized that wasn't me. Right. I wasn't that poor kid in the south. I mean, literally barefooted, running around with just you know shorts on. Right. And, and I was, I was, my heart was broken first and foremost. But I was like, you know what? You know, the best thing I can do is be my best, the best person I can possibly be. Realize the sacrifices that my grandmother actually made. Um, you know, for the family. And I'm looking right. at, wow, she, you know, she, and, and she was an educator as well. So, you know, education was always being in the family. Um, and, and I watched it. I realized I got, I had so many aunts who were teachers, you know, and administrators. And she was actually um, a teacher. And, and I, and I remember going back and hearing people who knew her. And it's funny because that's how I found out that I was related to John Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> was because I was having a conversation. Uh, this is to be a marriage. I was having a conversation with his wife, and she's from Brookhaven, Mississippi. And um, my grandmother lived in this house on this corner in Washington Ave. And over the years, my my aunt used to have a little juke joint in the spot, and they had a little ice house that was in there, you know. So she had uh, she cooked fish dinners, and they'd be in there sipping on sipping on that on that moonshine and and, and listen to, you know, uh, <laughs> Al Green. And in any case, I, I had described where my grandmother lived, and, and she knew exactly what I was talking about. And she's like, "You talk about Miss Ruth?" I said, "She said, you know, that's my people's." I said, well, "That's your people. That's my grandmother." And she said, "Boy, you know, we cousins." <laughs> wow. And then it, it went from there. And I remember um, I was, I think I was actually at Mel Pender's house when that happened. I was at Mel Pender's house, uh, 68, 64 Olympia, 100 meters. Shout out to brother Mel Pender. And I was at his house with you know room full of my my track and field heroes. I mean, it was so many Olympians in there. It was for Mel's birthday, matter of fact. And um, I spoke with with John's wife, uh, and the next thing I put her and my mom on the phone, and they were on the phone for like two hours. And I was wow. like, wow, this is crazy. And I realized we got cousins. They got cousins that married my cousins. So it was just a whole a big thing. So family reunion. Big, a big family. And so like I said, before I even got went to Europe. After I put everything in storage, I went and slept on slept on the on the and well actually in the guest room. I just sleep on the couch. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went and slept in the guest room um, till it was time for me to for them to, to take me to the airport. So that was really right. cool. So I would have had you know, and, and and all my dreams, I would have never known that you know I would be related via marriage. He's still my my cousin. Yeah. To, yeah. To the, to the great John Carlos and like you know. Um, I, 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 you know, I pinch myself all the time, and I'm, and I'm very fortunate. And like I said, and my humility comes from just knowing where I, where my people's come from. Right. There's no need for me to be, you know, abrasive with anybody, mean and nasty. I'm just, I'm just who I am. You know, I got big pursuits like everybody else, and, and um, I just, I enjoy it. But the, the whole, you know, me being here in Europe, like I said, this is, this is, this, like I said, I never even thought I'd be here. This is a, it was a situation which got me here uh, pursuing a, a graduate degree, a master's degree of all things. And um, it's, it came at a very good time in my life. Right. Um, and it really opened up some doors for me as far as realizing how respect, I'm realizing how respected I am in the, in the athletics community. You know, yeah. uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a real good feeling. And plus I kind of get to get to be relevant again, you know, I mean, yeah. last year when uh, we were, um, you know, watching the run on records. You know, nobody's record was safe last year. You had Echeverria in the long jump. You had Warham in the, in the four hurdles. Uh, 
you, 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 of course, you had the young guy, uh, what's his name, Mondo, doing his thing in the pole vault, and it was just, right. it was just, it was just for me personally, it was beautiful to kind of watch that because I was actually in Europe watching all these things go down. Um, I had opportunity to even go to some of the track meets that were going on, uh, and I was like, wow, it had been a minute since I actually been over here, mm-hmm. uh, and. And then I, I get to meet you know, folks on television and just have these conversations. The funny thing is when you find people realize that um, they know of the record, but they, could have, they haven't even made the connection to, uh, to me being a world record holder. And it's interesting with my, a, lot of, a few of my professors, we discuss the IOC and Olympics all the time. And I'm just sitting there in class, you know, just Kevin Young. And I remember uh, this is like about a week ago, one of my classmates from the, from the Mainz campus, they had, they had to interview somebody in class to discuss sports. And um, so one of my classmates, she, she, on the Zoom call, she asked me, you'd be okay if, if I interview. Matter of fact, it was, since I was American, she wanted to know about the American sports system and how athletes matriculate through it. Because I know in Europe, a lot of youngsters are either in clubs and academies um, and we go through, you know, we're in school and have all these Pop Warner programs and all these, you know, AAUs and that sort of thing. So it was a big difference between the way athletes kind of come through. And so that was the question, but they had no idea who I was. And so I got an opportunity to, to, to tell them that, um, you know, uh, my name is who I am. And you can go on Google and YouTube and Wikipedia and do all this cool stuff. And they were like, wow, you're, you know, I say, yeah, I'm the, I'm the shit. <laughs> exactly. Listen, I know exactly who you are. That is for sure. 100%. So I was actually, you know, just poking around, like you said, Google and all that good stuff. And I looked at something that I read and I was like, this can't be true. This cannot be true. I read that you were actually initially a walk on at UCLA. Tell okay. me that's not true. Oh, yeah. oh, Shut you, the see, front see, door. See, that, that's why, that's why, I don't, I, you know, you know, in, in LA, as a kid growing up in LA, you know, there's. I wanted to go to USC all my life as a shorty. I, you know, I was going. You could tell me I wasn't going to be a Trojan, right? You couldn't tell I me know. that growing up, <laughs> growing up in LA. Um, only thing I liked about UCLA as a as a as a kid was their basketball team. You know, and I really wasn't a uh, UCLA football, and it was always UCLA basketball. But everything else was all USC. Anything and everything. You know, from Cheryl Miller to Larry Friend. You know. To the uh, uh, Dwayne Biggers, uh, not Dwayne, well, Dwayne, Luke Dwayne is the homie, his brother, uh, Biggers, all those SC guys, you know, I, I knew so much about the SC guys, just, you know, the pursuits of being in the, in the Coliseum. But in any case, you couldn't tell me I was going to uh, go to SC. And a long story happened on the way to church. <laughs> and this is what happened. Um, I was a, I would say a top, a top ten athlete in my in my event. Um, but obviously, I wasn't on SC's radar when it came to track and field. And you know, in California, what you do is when when it comes to UC systems, you can fill out one application and you can check the different UC boxes to which campuses you want your application to be sent to. Um, in the case, of course, because they're I guess they're a public school. And of course, the SC is a private school. You know, you have to go to the channels. Um, however. I never did any much, I know, politicking. I never, you know, got any phone calls from any any coaches and that sort of thing. Um, but you can tell me I wasn't going to go to SC. And I actually sent a, um, I filled out an application to go to SC, and I got denied admissions uh, through one of their particular schools of, uh, of engineering. And I was just crushed, literally just, man. I'm not going to SC, you know, and and I'm talking like like I already had the money to pay for the education. I haven't have didn't have a dime, right, right. <laughs> you know, uh, and I think about a week or so later after that, I got a phone call from Coach Venegas, Art Venegas at UCLA, and he said he and he said Kevin, we we see that you had sent an application to come to the university here. Um, we would love to have you um, to come out for the track team. We said we can't provide you a scholarship. Um, but we'd love to have you have you on campus if you decide to uh, to pursue your education at UCLA. And of course, um, I thanked him for it. You know, I got off the phone, and I was already in my feelings when it came to getting that letter from USC telling me that I was denied admissions. I was hot. So of course, when Coach Venegas had hit me up on the telephone, I was like, "All right, yeah, I'm a, I'm going to UCLA. I'm gonna you know, go to UCLA. I'm gonna make them pay for like 
you know, right. except to me. And for those that Man. don't know, UCLA and USC are arch rivals, basically, in the Los exactly, Angeles area right? when it comes exactly. to sports. I, guess I grew and like growing up in LA, I would get on the RTD bus and be on Santa Barbara all the time. Anytime, you know, when it before it became MLK, it was it used to be called Santa Barbara. And you know, going to the, to, the, to the sports arena and passing the university, everything is like in that area. So, like I said, I literally grew up. On around that campus, around the streets, blocks, all through there on the bus, field trips, anything and everything, USC. And uh, <laughs> I didn't get accepted from that letter. And then the crazy thing about it is when I got the phone call from Coach Benegas, I was like, yeah, I'm going to US. I'm going to go to um, UCLA. So I remember getting the letter and signing the letter of intent to go to UCLA. So I sent that to them. And and that was a very interesting year because that was in 84 when they had the Olympic Games. So it was, right. you know, in my mind, it was, you know, watching the Olympic Games, school starts that fall. And I had a summer job at the Jet Propulsion Lab. You know, I was, uh, you know, I was thinking about being this astrophysicist at one point. <laughs> but wow. I actually got lucky um, to, to, to be in this, uh, this program um, with, at JPL. And, and they had selected minority kids around in Compton Watts, LA, to work there for about six weeks and get paid for it in different departments at, at the uh, Jet Proportion Lab, right? And that was really cool. Um, and the interesting thing about it, so we're going out, you know, going to Pasadena every day on the 110, driving past the Coliseum, hearing the crowd scream and yelling yeah, fireworks and all that. And bumper to bumper traffic trying to carpool, you know, between Compton Watts. Because we had, because my, I had my, my peers, I remember Cynthia, I can't think of Cynthia's uh, last name, but shout outs to you, Cynthia, where, wherever you are. Uh, she used to come to the house and pick me up um, on 107th Street. And she, I remember going, wow. And I couldn't take the, you know, I couldn't, and you know, this is crazy, check this, let me just back up a little bit. State meet was in, they had the state meet in California in the Coliseum in June. They had the Olympic trials, the, the, the Olympic trials uh, after the, the California state meet. So I'm already in the Coliseum for the California state meet by myself, um, running the high hurdles, the 110s. And that was my first level when it comes to hurdles. It definitely wasn't the intermediates. <laughs> and so I'm running the 110s. I take third place in the 110. So you know, I don't think I'm going to be on the radar. Fast forward after that point. I get denied admissions at USC, so I'm pissed off and mad. I get the call from Coach Venegas that they would love for me to walk on UCLA. I'm like, all right, well, cool. And I won a $1,000 scholarship from Coca-Cola over the summer being the Coca-Cola future Olympian. And uh, Coca LA Balling Company, Coca-Cola LA Balling Company, um, one of their little marketing schemes that they had, you know, do good in the neighborhood, support, uh, one of the uh, you know the local kids and the cool piece about it was i'm not going it was it was dope because i got a thousand dollars you know for my registration fees to go to, to go to ucla um yeah uh, and shout out to la la the los angeles sentinel newspaper because um, um brad pie jr used to hold me down i must admit when i was a youngster at, at, at jordan high school he used to always write little articles in, in la Sentinel about kevin young kevin young. keep your eye on kevin young he, he always <laughs> I must admit, he always must have knew I was going to do something with my track and field career because he always big me up when I was a shorty. And um, I ended up going to, end, you know, between going to Jet Proportion Lab and working, coming back home, watching the Olympic Games, the Olympic trials on television, uh, and preparing myself to go to, 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 US, to UCLA in the fall. I was like, okay, cool. Um, so it, I ended up getting to UCLA in the fall. And, it, and, and the crazy thing was this. Although I wanted to go to SC all my life, when I got to the UCLA's campus, I realized a number, a few things. First of all, crack was, in 1984, everybody, all my partners, they all were selling dope. It was mm. just, get in where you fit in. I'm like, I'm going to be a track star. I was telling everybody, I'm going to be a track star. So I stayed, I, I stayed out of trouble on that end. Um, but then when I left Watts and went to the West Side, I'm like, yo, so this is where UCLA is located? It's nestled between <laughs> Beverly Hills, Bel Air, Brentwood, Santa Monica. 
I'm right here on this campus. I said, I'm, and I said, I know where USC is. You know, you step two, two, two blocks off of USC, you're going to get jammed up. And I was like, wow, I'm here. And I was like, you know what? I can always go back, you know, go back and forth to Wasco, go check on moms and my nephew, my nieces and my sisters and all them. I said, but this is kind of cool because I was like, wow, people actually live like this. You know, I mean, literally. Yeah. Um, and it, it blew my mind when I got there. Like I said, my biggest thing at that point was, okay, okay, how are you going to stay here? You know, how are you going to, you know, how are you going to afford, you know, stay here consistently with the psychology, the mental aspect of it, to stay mm-hmm. in school. Um, because well, you I, had a I lot of there, things to, to kind of focus on because you had, there were some huge names at UCLA at the time. Yo, and this you had crazy. your when, own uh, scholarship, you know, for trying to find your funding to pay for your school. There's a so lot to a lot focus on. on. So, so how did you manage being in such an environment? Because going there in 84, uh, you know, like you said, you're, you're lucky that anyone at this point has even noticed you. So you're thankful for you that. You know the crazy thing so about it being that into 88, a whole new, a whole new show. A whole new show. It's funny because US, UCLA had already recruited, you know, going in as a high hurdler, you know, when I, like I said, I went to the campus going in as, as, as a high hurdler and a jumper as well. And not necessarily um, this this sought after 400 meter hurdles because you know in Cali we all ran only 300 meter hurdles we didn't run the fours so of course I literally had to add another 100 meters to the to the race itself but like I said my my whole focus was being in running the 110s and but when I got to UCLA they had already had the the California State Champion two years before I got there <laughs> then they had the, then they had the uh, they had they had Steve Kerho, they had Raymond Young who um, won the state championship in '84 uh, from uh, from Hawthorne High School, and um, uh, Demery, Jeff Demery, I think that was the gentleman's name. He went to school with Kerho. I mean, they had an abundance of high one ten high hurdlers, right? right? Abundance of them. So I kind of got in there, got in where I fit in as as this walk on. And you know how competitive it is on those on the college campuses. You got you know, these guys were on scholarship and I was the walk on. So I was either I wasn't much of a threat that they didn't think, but they gave me, you know, upon my, my French, they gave me a lot of shit for just being out there. It's like that, like, dude, why are you even out here? We right. got you know, we got these guys who represent UCLA in the one ten. You just you just here for fodder. You just you know, back you know, background noise. Right. And um so my pursuit was like, yo. I need to do anything and everything I knew that I can do to make this team. Because if I don't make the team, you know, going in as a walk on, because was, I was the only walk on coming out there. It was about 20 or 30 of us as walk ons coming out of UCLA. Wow. And um, I got in there and, and, and I just got in where I fit in. But I realized uh, that typically the 110 hurdlers, the ones that are really good at 110s, they didn't want to run the run the run the force. Right. <laughs> so yeah, because I read was, that I read yeah. that so somebody, situation where Andre Andre kind of encouraged you with that thirty seven inch yo, inseam yo, you have to head towards the long. When I this blew my mind though, right? When I get to UCLA, I see literally damn near half the team USA from eighty four is team out there training yeah. with you know with, with the different coaches out there with Coach Kersey. I'm out there, I see Al Joyner. Florence Griffin, you know, Alice Brown, um, Valerie Briscoe Hooks, um, Jeanette Bolden. Wow. And I'm looking at Jackie and, and, and who else is out there? And they had some throwers that were out there. I think uh, Bill Green. Um, they had, they, I mean, I literally, all a uh, number of people that I saw on television in the 84 Olympics were out there, you know, training again, getting ready for the following year. And I was like, yo, and I literally watched these great athletes and watch how they train, how they got down. And I was like, wow, this is what it is. And I really feel, I feel secure enough, like, okay, if, if, you know, if I'm out here on the track with Olympians, this is the best place for me to be at, right? right. And that was the kind of attitude in which I had. And then of course, when I saw Flo out there, um, Florence Griffin, Florence Griffin Joyner, Flo Joe, I was like, well, cool. You know, that's Flo, you know, we went to the same high school, you know, me and her <laughs> little brother went to middle school together. And, um, uh, and so that connection was there. So I was like, all right, cool. I, I, I didn't feel, I didn't feel lonely. You know, right. I felt that I had, a, I had, but I definitely had something to prove once I got out there. And it was just a way of which I had to channel my energy because I realized I wasn't really, my aptitude really wasn't 
was on par to be with a lot of, you know, academically to be at the university. I, I, I struggled um, and realized that I had dyslexia. You know, it's a trip when, you, when you're being diagnosed with something, but when you get there, you realize that you're in classes and, and you're hearing these information, listen to these lectures, and you under, you understanding what they're saying, but when you go to put it on paper, it just kind of comes out backwards. <laughs> yeah, that happened yeah. to me many times, and so I literally had to. I literally had to watch. You kind of, you know, you watch the things that actually, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The things that goes down to D one schools, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah. UCLA has a prize basketball program, prize football program. Track and field was just, you know, a, you know, and they, you know, they have a historic track and field program, but believe you, the funding is there for the for the the the, the, um, the revenue making sports. And so you saw the, the disposition in which our athletes were getting treated, whether they're ball players or they're track stars. And um, on all different types of levels, you know, literally the football team, basketball team had their own tutors, <laughs> you know, and they had they they had their own tutors, they had all these different edu- educational connections. And if you if you weren't, you know, in, in tune in line with, with certain individuals. You wouldn't preview to be in certain places for your, for your education and uh, right. um, I have the luxury of that. And like I said, after my first year, I realized how to how to maneuver on that campus. And I think once I got that happened to me, I realized that, yo, OK, I can make it here because I literally I was literally there on campus with guys that I competed against in high school who were there at UCLA on, on scholarship. Mm. But they weren't able to navigate, you know, coming from the inner city going into, onto that campus and literally dealing with just being like a fish out of water, you know, right. dealing with, you know, just the, the, the psychology of it, the psychiatry of it. Um, right. And the push and pulls factors of what do you do and, and, and trying to, you know, make the, make the best location uh, and, 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 and point for themselves while they're there. I remember going to Drake stadium many days and, you know, Many nights, lights are out, pitch black. I'm in the middle of Drake said, crying my head off. I'm saying, like, damn, why am I here? I'm about to fill out a school. I don't know if I'm going to make it on, make, make it on the squad. Um, it was just one of those situations was just a big load on my shoulders. And I didn't think I had anybody to turn to. Um, uh, however, uh, it worked out. I, real, I, I, li- I literally realized that, <laughs> you know, the only objective that I, I would have to go to, I had to, you know, if, if I got kicked out of the school, I'm going back to Watts, I'm going back right. to Watts. I'm going to get caught up with anything and everything that my partners are, are, caught, are caught up doing. Because the first right. thing is going to be like, yo, this is what I'm doing. Come here, hold on this, hold right. on that. Um, and it'd be too easy. And, and I realized that that wasn't the challenge that I wanted in my life. The right. challenge was was to go through all the all the all the all the stuff there at UCLA's campus and find my way through it, and and then it got easier, you know. It, it you know I got an understanding of being on campus. I remember realizing that, you know, sometimes you got to take certain courses to pad up your GPA, uh, you know. And I remember taking I I, I took an African dance class. Uh, <laughs> I I'm did. sure I the world would love to see African, that. African dance class, Kaki Lambe, <laughs> hey, you know, <laughs> and everybody's doing African dance now, 30 yeah, years later. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> and, you uh, did push through and and that had yeah. allowed you to really achieve because by in 88, you were only 22 years old. You went to your first Olympics and you got fourth place. Like, I don't know if anyone knows because, you know, you have gymnastics, they start really young, but for track and field to be 22, and to achieve that, it's really tough. It's really, it's really a big step, um, which then led on to more achievements, more accomplishments over the next yeah. four years. So talk about being so young and achieving that. Did you know at that point, oh, I'm coming for that you goal? You know what it was? I was, I was, I was motivated. I, did, I made it, I, the, you know, my freshman year at UCLA, I made it to the, our, our conference championships. I think I was fifth in the conference, 51 right. on in the, in the my sophomore year, I made my big breakthrough. And it's funny because that was literally the year in which I really connected with John Smith that year. Mm. Prior to that, um, I was being a dedicated hurler. So we had a hurdles coach at the time, Alan Rigby. Um, and he was really, he was a high hurdles coach. You know, he, he like I said, he was, he was a high school coach for uh, Jeff Demery and, and Steve Kerho. Uh, at Mission Viejo High School. And so um, he made it to UCLA, got hired as, as an assistant coach. 
And his focus was definitely on, you know, getting them and making them better, as well as, you know, help, help me out become a better hurler. And like I said, I was trying to get in where I fit in. So I was doing the intermediates. I was doing the 110s. I was doing the long jump. I was doing the triple jump. And if they needed me to do the high jump, I was willing to go over there and do that as well. Um, and we, like I said, we had an abundance of high hurler, hurlers. So in any given day, you know, you know, we you be in a race or you won't be in a race. Uh, if you're not running, if you're not running the highs one rate one weekend, you definitely gonna run the intermediates and and a four by four. So you're constantly all over the place. Like I said, I was trying to be where I needed to be, and it wasn't to, it wasn't until when John got there, John was you know trying to make a, make a way for himself as a, as a, as a first time uh, assistant coach, and he had a lot of. Um, older classmen at the university, young men who were coached by Coach Bush, you know, before he had retired. And um, they were, you know, they didn't they didn't think much too highly of John at the time. And like I said, John was trying to figure out how he's going to make this happen. The beautiful thing that happened in my sophomore year was that was the freshman year of Danny Everett, and Mike Marsh and, and Henry Thomas, you right. know, those guys. Those guys came in as freshmen. And that took that literally took the program up a thousand percent when it came to you know her, uh, sprints, sprints and and, um, and that like and even the, um, the 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 psychology of the team the motive. Yeah, because so, you guys ended yeah. up being the first collegiate team to run under three minutes, right, for the four by four. That's right. That's right. We were, and it's and it's funny. And that wasn't my junior year. No. Yeah. No, actually, that was my that was my senior. Year, but that was a year in which. When when Stephen when Stephen Lewis he okay, came yeah. on camp on to the campus and the cool piece was you know my sophomore year I made that was my big breakthrough year I went you know I ran forty eight seventy seven um, ranked in the world I think eighty six I went to the, went to the Goodwill Games in Moscow uh, so I was actually became I became an international athlete in nineteen eighty six traveling the world going to Brazil and all over Germany. Zurich and this bouncing all in and, 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 and UK all over the place. So like I said, here's a nappy head kid out of Watts, you know, trying to stay away from all his dope Dylan partners in the hood, struggling at UCLA, um, make, finally make a little breakthrough. And the next thing it was like, yo, you got a ticket to go to Moscow. And I had never <laughs> been out of the country. And here I'm going, here I'm going to Russia in 1986. The Berlin Wall hadn't been getting knocked down to 89. So, you know, I, I was there going, wow, this is, you know, because of track, you know, I'm, I'm, I could do this with my, with my eyes closed. Yeah. Um, make the, we make, well, actually, my sophomore year, we make the big breakthrough because we had, we had, we had, we had Henry Thomas and we had Danny Everett. And, and, I, and I got on the four by four with those guys. And we went to Indianapolis um, in 86. And I ended up, I ended up, as a, I ended up taking second place behind one of my track and field heroes. Danny Harris, because I, like I said, Danny Harris is a California legend when it comes to the, to, the, to the hurdles. And then for him to go and win that silver medal in 84, me glued to the TV watching him get down. And uh, and then my sophomore year to race against him, um, like I said, nobody knew who Kevin Young was. And like I said, my biggest highlights at that time was all, you know, going to Cal State, Cal State, uh, uh, L.A., running, running track meets. Going to Mount Sac, running track meets. Going to Long Beach, running. I mean, I was. I, I loved going to the local meets. You know, be honest with you, I was. I got a, such a, a, a kick going to the local meets because that's when you saw, you know, you would see uh, these these track celebrities. You know, I wasn't right. on nobody's radar, you know, but you would see, you know, Foster and Kingdom, and the, you know those guys and Tony Campbell, and they they're pursuing. And like I said, I remember watching the World Championships in 1983. And Helsinki going, well, okay, wow, this is, you know, hearing about the 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 uh the Pan Am games and, and down in South America and that big fiasco. Uh and, but then in the 86 having the opportunity to to do all this traveling. And and like I said, we're gonna, are we gonna fast forward because I can't begin 87 where we had the um we had the Pan Am games in 87. I took I took second behind Winter Graham in the Hurts. But in 88, 22 years old. But the beauty of that was the fact that we had we had boss man on the team. That's Stephen Lewis, by the way, you guys. That's his that's his nickname we gave him back in the day. I call him Sauce Man now. He changed it up since he's going after <laughs> robot. Um, but we had Stephen, 
Danny, Henry, and and and, and I literally my pursuit was literally watching these guys because, like I said, these guys were name brands in high school track and field. I wasn't, you know. I was an honorable mention in the L.A. Sentinel, maybe in the L.A. Times. Um, but I remember, you know, glued to the newspaper watching these guys, and not just me, but listen to all the chatter from everybody in the track and field of community. Talk about these these high school athletes. And then you see them. You know, I remember seeing Danny when he was at Fairfax. He ran at, at UCLA. And uh, he had on, like, tights, you know, some red tights, yellow top, red red shorts. And he ran the quarter, and this is one. This is the signature of Danny Everett. Danny ran the quarter, ran forty-five and something. Just got down, walked, and just grabbed his gear, and walked off the track. Wow! <laughs> well, usually everybody's laid out, bent right. over in the <laughs> infield, looking for water. You know, he right. really went to the basket, scooped up his clothes, and just walked off the track like. Another day, and I was like, "That dude is—he's amazing." It was like he's coming to UCLA too. Oh my God! And then when Stephen got there, it was just a battle. You know, I was like eating popcorn watching them two dudes run every weekend. <laughs> you know, every week, right. watching Stephen, Danny. You had know, the freshman going after the sophomore, and I'm the junior, just looking at it. You know, because I'd already been on the on a, on a UCLA four by four team. We we took we was runner ups against SMU in the eighty six the eighty six team. Um, with robot, robot. See, I know, I know a lot about robot. Robot, <laughs> Roy Martin. Did robot, was I on the same leg when robot ran? Did robot? No, robot didn't run me down. I think Robozine, Kevin Robozine. I ran with Kev. Any case, that's another story. But uh, that that set up that 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 was at eighty eight. That set up the whole momentum we came into eighty eight. Right, right. Because SMU, I think they had the collegiate record in the four by four, of, uh, four minutes, eighty five seconds, four minutes. Four minutes, no, no, three zero zero eighty five in nineteen eighty six. We went to LSU in nineteen eighty seven. We ran three zero zero seventy seven, and we and we won and um, won the national championships in the four by four um, at, at Baton Rouge uh, in, in eighty seven. And then the following year in Eugene. We went to there, and of course, that's when we ran uh, two fifty nine ninety one, and uh, we broke we broke three minutes in that in that in that four by four. But the cool piece is, and I tell these guys now, I know, you know, Danny, Steve, Hindu, they all, you know, Danny and Steve are sub forty four second quarter milers, easy forty three. You can name it. Henry probably possibly do the same thing, but on that relay, I had the fastest split and. Uh, <laughs> I tell those guys to this day. I said, you know, I know you guys are you guys are the other are the ish. I said, but y'all could not run me that day in the four by four. You know, right. I had my right. little forty four and change. Um, but the beauty of it is, it was able, literally, it was for us able to 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 um to come together. You know, with you know with with, with John Smith's magic. You know, uh, he and his tutelage and to get us all on one page for us to go out there and really want to run and be our best. Um, right. And that was that like that was a knockout year for me because I like I said eighty eight, I won my I won my second national championship, well my second my second national championships in the four by four because I won I won the four hundred hurdles and the four by four in eighty seven. I'm a two time national champion eighty seven, became a two time national champion again in eighty eight, and then we go to Indianapolis that summer. Later on in that summer. You know to qualify for the 88 Olympic team in Seoul, and so of course that was drama as well because I got in as a as a photo finish for for, for third place wow. uh, at the Olympic trials in 1988. So I literally got in by the skin of my teeth, uh, and then obviously you know going to go, going to Korea, you know watching watching Danny and and, and Steve and Butch. I can't count out Butch. Because you know, in '88, in, that, in August, Bush had just set the world record in the 400 in Zurich. You were in the 43:29, and I thought that was—I thought that was the, the, the craziest race of my life. <laughs> but I remember when we got back to the states, um, prior to the, the Olympic, the Olympics in, in Seoul, you can see—I I personally could see Stephen was was was. He was he was somewhere else in his in his head with that you know right he 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 had some up his sleeve, and um, 
I guess he must have played that race back in his head over and over again on how it went down in Zurich. And um, he knew that he had a strategy. And right. and I realized that was that was like one of the first one of the first times that I realized how being strategic is so important when it when it when it comes to racing. A lot of times we get in those races and we go off our adrenaline and what we've done in training and practice. A lot of times we don't we don't realize how strategic we have to be in those cases. <laughs>